Hello, this is Ian Harper welcoming you to Business of Weather podcast, produced in association with Intermet Digital, the online portal dedicated to extreme weather and climate change, flooding and poor air quality. In each episode, we'll investigate the increasing impact of extreme weather and climate change on business and society, and how weather technology and information services can address the growing challenges. The aim is to spotlight the opportunities for entrepreneurs, startups and investors to develop the business potential of assisting weather-affected enterprises. In this episode, we speak to Rolls-Royce about its small modular reactor program and the potential for small nuclear to play a significant role in a net zero power generation strategy. Can this program really deliver a factory produced nuclear electric power system at a promise 50 pounds per megawatt hour? While this is well ahead of the cost of renewables, it's just half that of the new Hinkley Point C nuclear station, which is probably 10 to 15 years from operation. Since we spoke to Rolls-Royce on the 12th of October, it's been announced that a consortium comprising itself, BNF Resources and Exelon Generation, will invest £195 million of their own cash over the next three years, supplemented by a £210 million grant from the UK government. Much more investment will be needed to commercialise the programme. But this £405 million makes possible a big step towards an off-the-shelf plug-and-play nuclear generation system. A solution which could purportedly power a city the size of Leeds before the end of the decade. Just as importantly though, such a solution would be of enormous value elsewhere in the green energy economy. Most notably, in decarbonising transportation by helping provide the electricity required by the projected huge growth of electric vehicles, in the production of green hydrogen via electrolysis, and in making the no-carbon synthetic fuels essential to green aviation. Alan Woods, welcome to Business of Weather. Hello, thank you Ian, it's uh, great to be here. Now Alan... Can you please tell me, first of all, about yourself and your role in the Rolls-Royce Small Reactor or SMR programme? Sure. So my my role in the programme is the Director of Strategy and Business Development. My responsibilities include all aspects of our market engagement, our customers and the overall short, medium and long term strategy of our business. Okay, thanks. Now, for as long as I can remember, there's been talk about the possibilities of using smaller nuclear reactors in civil power generation applications which is something that's taken on some urgency in view of climate change. But let's take a look at the current Rolls-Royce SMR programme. How old is it? Where is it based? And what are its aims? And is it an exclusively civil programme? Right. So the programme is uh, about five years old. Uh, We've been inside Rolls-Royce working on it for for that duration. Um, It's based in our offices in Derby with centres in Warrington as well. Uh, and its aims are quite simply, we, we believe in nuclear power, but nuclear power has to be commercially investable. So the whole premise of our, our programme is to design and manufacture and produce a total nuclear power station, which is commercially investable, financeable by private finance, and, and therefore can penetrate the market at the level that's needed in order to make a significant contribution to, to climate change. And is it an exclusively civil programme? It is a civil programme, yes. Thank you. Now, can you tell me which companies are involved in the programme besides Rolls-Royce and how many people are currently employed by the programme overall? Uh, sure. So we've, we've we previously had a number of UK companies involved in the programme. Uh, they continue to support. Uh, we, we will shortly be moving into a separate arrangement where Rolls-Royce will be a shareholder of the programme with, with other equity shareholders. Uh, those UK companies that have supported us up until now will, will continue to do so, and they include household names such as Lango Rourke, Jacobs, um, Atkins, Amnuttall, uh, to mention but a few. Right, now, just to get a feel for nuclear engineering in the overall Rolls-Royce portfolio, how significant is nuclear-related business to the company's business model, and how might this change in the future? Indeed, 
Does Rolls-Royce see the SMR programme as a means of positioning its centre stage in a critical area when it comes to addressing the challenges of climate change? Right, well, Rolls-Royce has actually been involved in nuclear for about 60 years now, uh, and that's been predominantly in the defence side of the business where we, we design, manufacture the nuclear power plants for the, for, for the MOD. Um, this is a civil business, uh, and it comes off the back of Rolls-Royce's civil nuclear business, which has been operating for for a couple of decades now. Um, in terms of, of what it might mean for the future, SMRs need to play a contribution to overall uh, net zero agenda. And that's not just about power. It's also about heat and transport, particularly from a Rolls-Royce perspective. What we can do in terms of decarbonizing transport is really important. And there are a limited number of methods for decarbonizing transport. There's a lot talked about hydrogen at the moment. The Rolls-Royce perspective are particularly interested in synthetic fuels, but you need lots of clean power to generate these future fuels. And an SMR can play a vital role in cleanly generating those fuels of the future, which can decarbonize those other sectors. So it's becoming more and more important um, as, as it's a, a, a cornerstone of, of decarbonization across those, those three pillars of power, heat and transport. Right. Very interesting that you've mentioned SMRs in the production of hydrogen synthetic fuels, because I'm going to come to that a bit later on. But first of all, I'd like to move on and take a look at some specific aspects of the technology to be used for the SMRs. So, first of all, let's take a look at the nature of the SMR technology. What sort of reactors are SMRs and what sort of fuel do they use? Okay, well, there's there's a lot of different SMRs out there in the market. Typically, if you look at classifications, many governments classify them in terms of near-term SMRs and and future, often called AMRs or Generation 4 technology. And there's a variety of different technologies and a variety of different fuels. Our program is based on um, conventional pressurized water reactor, light water reactor technology, which is prevalent across the world today. And that was an intentional decision to ensure that we can expedite the process through various regulators around the world but also we fit into existing infrastructure around the nuclear industry. So it uses conventional fuel, um, and, and that means that we, we, we can get going more quickly, we can get it regulated and get it built in a timely manner. Sorry, what is conventional fuel? Conventional fuel is um, normal fuel that's used in, in, in civil reactors today, so the same fuel that's used in, in the existing fleet in the UK, for example. What, uranium? Yes. Right, okay. So uranium-based fuel, yes. Now, is an agreed design for an SMR? I think you alluded to others, but let me just ask this question anyway. Is there an agreed design for an SMR? And to what extent has the technology to be used for SMRs been tried and tested? For example, are they similar to the PWRs that have been used in nuclear submarines for many years now? Or have they been changed or modified in any way to make them more suited to civil applications and so easier to manufacture? Right. So, uh, again, when we talk about a variety of SMRs, there are different designs. Ours is a tried and tested, proven PWR technology. So it's the same technology that's used in, in existing nuclear power plants today. It is the same as um, submarine technology, but it's a different power plant. It's designed for civil application. It encompasses all of the latest safety features, passive safety, passivity, etc., and it, principally, it is designed to be easier to manufacture. But I should stress, this is not just a reactor program. It's a power station program. So when we talk about ease of manufacture, modularization, that's at power station level. This is important that we look at the total power plant, not just the reactor, when we talk about modularization. So it, it would be all ready to plug into the grid? Absolutely. Right, okay. Now, who actually owns the technology using the SMRs you're making? Is it owned by Rolls-Royce or by somebody else? So our design, the, the Rolls-Royce SMR design, is, is owned by, by Rolls-Royce SMR, yes. Now, how do small nuclear reactors differ from large ones? I always imagine small reactors would be portable, but the, the ones you're talking about seem to be quite large to me. Okay, so when we talk about small um yeah, it's important to understand what we're talking about. So it's a 470 megawatt plant, and the size of it is is derived from the requirements we put on the design. And the, the main requirement that, that drives that power output is one of road transportability. 
So our power plant is modular. It's made up of a large number of modules, which are all uh, transportable on the back of a truck or rail. And that, that defines actually the power of the, of the plant itself. So in terms of site area, um, yeah, the, the actual core power station is about one and a half football pitches, but might seem quite large. But in the context of existing power plants, um, it's a lot smaller. So they're not portable. They're not mobile plants. Um, mm -hmm. Where they differ from large ones is in the approach to delivery manufacturing. This is this is moving away from what we call large infrastructure projects, one-off infrastructure projects, to a factory repeatable product. Mm -hmm. So 80, 90 percent of our power plants is manufactured in a factory environment. And it's a very, very different approach. That's a pretty big proportion. Now, how much electricity would one of your, a single SMR of the type you're making provide? And what would be the lifetime of such a device? I've heard that one SMR could power a city the size of Leeds or over 60,000 electric cars, for instance. That's correct. So it's uh, 470 megawatts electrical outputs. And it will last for, it's designed to have a lifetime of 60 years. 60 years, that's, that's quite a long time. And then it would have to be, what, dismantled, disposed of, whatever. Then it gets decommissioned, um, would it be modular? So we, ha we, we have to design for life cycle. So that starts at design for, as I mentioned earlier, licensing, design for manufacture, design for installation, commissioning, operation. And finally, it's designed for dismantling. So it's a modular construction, it's a modular deconstruction. So we can expedite, speed up the dismantling process at the end of those, that 60 year life. Right. OK. Now, from what I understand, the SMRs will pr be predominantly manufactured in factories, as you said, to take advantage of economies of scale. Is this, is this correct? And if so, when, where will these factories actually be built and how big would they be? Mm. So it, it is designed to be manufacturing factories, and actually we have three different types of, of module factory. So we have a, a, a civil module factory, which does the major civil modules. We have what we call bands of plants, so systems modules fa factory, and they're ISO container type size modules. And then we have what we call the primary plant modules, and those are the, the, the major vessels which form the, the reactor island. Um, it's all about economies of volume, not scale. So this is about designing factories to make those modules and the modules to be made in those factories. And that's around a production line approach. That's how we get economies of volume. That's how we get the capital cost of each module down through that production line approach in the factories. So when and where will these be built? We, we're yet to decide that. Uh, we'd have a set of criteria that will determine the best places to manufacture these factories. And that those will be decisions we make over the, the coming um, months and, and early, early into the next phase, next couple of years. Right, okay. Now, what would you say are the main technical challenges to mass production of uh, SMRs? Yeah, so in technical terms, we've we've taken we've removed many of the risks associated with with uh, traditional infrastructure projects. So, we're no longer making one-offs. So, all, our power plant is designed to to make use of commercially available component parts where they exist. We're not designing product that requires specialist niche components to be made. So we've removed a lot of those challenges. It's a factory environment. So we're making many modules in, in different facilities. So uh, actually, we've moved this to a logistics challenge, um, how we get all of the goods inwards into those facilities and the modules out the facilities in the right sequencing to arrive on the site and prevent us having um, lots of lay down areas. That's, that's really where we've moved the technical challenge to is that, that logistics one, but that's a, a manageable solution and there's plenty of organizations that deal with that level of complexity already around today right okay now how long would it actually take to implement a single smr power station which could power say a city the size of leeds mm. so the first the first unit we're targeting early 2030s to be grid ready and that will be mm. determined by when we get our first order and uh, aspects associated with with licensing and planning and permitting Thereafter, we can actually build these units. We're talking to build them in a four-year time frame. So um, that, that's achievable because we, we manufacture the power plant off-site and we deliver it to the site and assemble those modules so we can get a much quicker um, assembly schedule uh, for subsequent units. 
Right, so you're looking at nine to ten years from now to have the first one operational. For the first unit, and that's because we have uh, a number of aspects around first unit engineering that, that is unique to that first plant. Right, now that would be, would it be operational or really just a test plant? No, that will be a full operational unit. Okay, so where do you think it might be located? Any thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the UK has today an awful lot of existing nuclear license sites, many of which have got a decommissioned power plant on them. Um, those existing license sites represent the best location, the easiest location for, for, for the first number of units. Uh, the principal reason for that is they are an existing license site. They have the infrastructure already there, grid connectivity, et cetera. So it just makes the whole process a lot easier to, to use those existing license sites. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, from a, a green green employment perspective, this this project sounds pretty exciting. So, what are the implications for job creation of a full blown SMR program? What's your What's your market research tell you about all of this? Mm, the The implications for jobs is huge. Um, so, this is a UK it's domestic solution. Um, that means that we're not just looking at the UK market; we're looking at exports. And the number of jobs is a function of how many. Uh, of how many orders we get, the rate at which we need to build them. Our facilities are built to have a capacity of two per annum. That's our module facilities. If we want to increase that capacity, we can replicate the facilities. Um, these facilities are assembly facilities, so they rely on a very broad and large supply chain beneath it. So our estimates for a relatively conservative rollout would, would create in the region of 40,000 plus jobs um, in, in the near term. Uh, of course, the, the quicker we build, the more we build, the more exports we create, that number can grow. So it's a it's a huge opportunity for the not just the nuclear industry, but other industries which can grow from having SMR power plants in existence. And those industries that, that need moving to the future, lots of reliable, clean electrical power. Yeah, that's quite a significant number of people. Do, do you have any idea of what sort of industries uh, your project would help uh, fuel in terms of uh, their own uh, job creation and product output? Yes, we do, because the market is changing. And I, I spoke at the start about this isn't just about grid electricity. So, of course, we will supply power to the grid. We look at net zero, though, um, how we decarbonize industry. Uh, you have to question whether it's feasible that we can put all of that future electrical generation into a grid. So uh, from an economic perspective, there are arguments that say we need to start clustering heavy use industries around the power generation plants like an SMR that can provide that reliable, clean power. So we're talking about industries around the, the, the new hydrogen economy, um, potential synthetic fuel economy, um, heavy industrial users that exist today, but also new high-tech industries. So we see Bitcoin has an astronomical amount of power, for example, and data centers are, are growing and requiring more and more power. Clustering these around a power-dense clean energy source like an SMR is a really smart move in terms of reducing the, the overall costs, but also creating clusters of energy hubs, if you like, uh, which will attract more and more industry. Business of Weather, spotlighting the business opportunities of extreme weather and climate change. So now that brings me neatly, brings us neatly to my next uh, question about nuclear technology and net zero objectives. Uh, now the thing about renewable energy sources is they can be intermittent as we've found in the last few weeks when there hasn't been the wind generation that had been anticipated. And uh, and in view of the problems of continuing to use fossil fuels for power generation, nuclear clearly appears to have a role to play in uh, our low carbon energy future. So tell me, how important does Rolls-Royce, the company itself, see that SMRs are when it comes to achieving net zero goals when it comes to power generation? I think Rolls-Royce re reflects the general environment that people are becoming increasingly aware that clearly renewables have a role to play, but they are limited in the fact that they are intermittent. And grid energy storage is, is very expensive and very difficult if, if it's all achievable. So you need something which can provide that clean, dispatchable power. And it needs to provide that clean, dispatchable power, as I said, for, for the future industries that can also generate the clean fuels to power transport, aviation, um, and, and generate you know, clean fuels for heat. So it's incredibly important that we have nuclear and SMRs are 
a commercially investable version of nuclear. So when we look at these new markets where industries need the power, we're not talking about grid, we have to have a privately financeable, commercially investable solution. And, and our SMR is designed to be exactly that. Right. Now, uh, you've done a lot of market research on what you've said into the potential contribution of SMRs. Can you put any sort of figure on the potential percentage contribution they could make to helping achieve a low or no carbon energy future? So really, this is a question which um, which sits with, with the government in terms of their future energy mix. Um, the reality is, from our perspective, we can produce um, SMRs at whatever rate is required. As I said, it's a factory fabricated solution. So if we want to increase the rate of production, then we just construct additional module facilities. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, the supply chain will have to increase its capacity as well, but, but that's all eminently achievable. SMRs are about that factory environment. It's, it's not about moving big infrastructure projects from one site to another site to another site every 10 years or so. It's a completely different approach. Um, so SMRs can make a really significant contribution. Um, there are plenty of sites in the UK that could house a number of SMRs. So we're looking forward to working with the government to actually make SMRs a significant contributor in the, in the short, medium and long term. You've mentioned the uh, the use of SMRs, the electricity generated by them in other areas of decarbonisation, in particular uh, cracking water to produce green hydrogen or to make synthetic fuels for air transport. Now, there's one area which is potentially bubbling up at the moment, so I hope you don't mind me briefly asking you about this, and this is how do we obtain uh, hydrogen? Do we get blue hydrogen from methane, or do we get green hydrogen by cracking water? At the moment, the water option, whilst cleaner, is slightly more expensive because of the, uh, the cost of electricity, although this is potentially changing as the advent of SMR shows. Do you see this as a particularly good piece of ground to... Um, to, uh, if you like, promote uh, the potential of uh, SMRs in our energy future? Absolutely. Um, both hydrogen, synthetic fuels and other applications, desalination is becoming increasingly important. All these are very important markets for SMRs. Uh, and if you look at the scale that's needed to uh, hydrogen, the amount of fossil fuels that we use today in transport and heat that we have to replace, the scale is vast. So Absolutely, they're incredibly strong markets for SMRs. Um, yes, you know, hydrogen from electrolysis, there will be in certain markets, for example, natural gas is, well, whilst very cheap, it's, it's volatile. The beauty of SMRs, though, is when we use them to generate these future fuels, we don't suffer that price volatility. It's a very fixed price. So that's worth having. Right, thank you. Now, just want to move on and ask a few questions about your target market. You've mentioned uh, numerous uh, markets for this, but aside from uh, the ones you've mentioned, do you see any potential markets in terms of specific industries? I think you've alluded to uh, clustering energy intensive industries around uh, SMR power facilities. Uh, but are there any that you have particularly in mind, such as uh, steel production, cement production or whatever? Um, we have a number in mind. Um, you know, we have what's called the Energy Intensive Users Group in the UK. Any of those users could be a potential off-taker of, of power from an SMR. Um, mm. From our perspective, all of these are, are applicable, um, and, and we're, we're pretty agnostic as to which industries could, could off-take the power. Um, there are many of them, to be honest, and it's, it's a growing number. As I said, the, the high-tech companies are growing all the time, and mm. they are, are, are requiring more and more electricity they all have their own net zero targets and that means that getting that dispatchable electricity 100 percent availability and it's clean is becoming more and more crucial to them and actually only only smrs can do that now some 17 million people live on or near the coast in the uk and worldwide the figure is absolutely enormous especially in the developing world could SMRs be used on ships so that they can be moved from place to place where energy is required? Um, so our SMR could not be used on a ship. It's a land-based power plant. However, it's designed to be road and rail transportable. So that's intentional because there are, as you allude to, many locations around the world which aren't by the coast or aren't by a river that have existing power plants. And we need to look at how we might play a role in replacing those into the future, so particularly around Central Europe, for example, it's, it's landlocked. Um, river access might be limited in many locations. 
So designing the power plant for a road transportable enables us to access any location anywhere in the world. Now, looking at potential export markets, have you identified any potential export markets already? We have, and we are. We, we, we categorise markets into into near, medium term, and, and future. And near term, you'll be surprised to hear are those markets where they already have nuclear um, are looking to replace their existing power plants with um, a, a replica power plant. And, and actually, our SMR is a very strong fit for those markets. In the medium and longer term, we are seeing an increasing number of, of, of countries move towards introducing nuclear power as they look at the the challenge of achieving net zero. So there are many, many more countries now starting to look at what is needed to become a nuclear power nation and are starting to go down the route of establishing all the necessary backbone and infrastructure that they need to, to eventually build nuclear power plants. So on that perspective, the, the world market is increasing. In the near term, there's, there's a large market in those existing territories that already operate nuclear plants. Business of Weather, spotlighting the business opportunities of extreme weather and climate change. Right, now, anything involved in nuclear technology is always going to be politically sensitive and potentially controversial because of uh, possible nuclear proliferation issues. Will this have any impact on potential markets for SMR technology and with that potential sales and lowering the unit costs? Uh, so our market analysis um, we, we, we purposely strip out those those territories which would be politically sensitive. Um, our market analysis without those is is significant, and therefore, from a business case perspective, no, it won't make any difference that we have to take them out. The, the market for clean electricity is significant um, globally, and there is absolutely sufficient in those territories which which are not politically sensitive. Now, just want to move on to the costs and particularly, you know, sort of comparison of costs with uh, other forms of green energy. Uh, now, because of the potential significance of F SMRs to a low carbon energy future, I'd like to get an idea of how the cost of power generated by SMRs might compare to other forms of generation, in particular renewables with battery storage, fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage, and also... Um, the estimated cost of electricity from the proposed new Hinkley Point station. Have you uh, first? So first of all, how much would a single functioning SMR cost in terms of construction, and also its lifetime costs, including waste disposal at the end of its life? Let's take the example of that SMR powering Leeds. I've I've heard the figure of seven hundred million pounds mentioned. Is is that accurate? Um, no, it's not. So one unit for our, once we get to the point where we're at our um, factory rollout, one unit will be 1.8 billion uh, for the 470 megawatt plant. And that will deliver um, electricity, a, a, a levelised cost of electricity of around £50 a megawatt hour. The main sensitivity on that cost will be how the power plant is financed and therefore designing it for predictability. That factory approach means we can deliver it at low risk and that means cost of financing will come down and, and with that the levelized cost of electricity will come down so that that's a key part it's not just about the capital it's also about the duration to build it and reducing to, and removing the risk that's what really achieves to say competitive low cost of electricity now clearly rolls-royce and its project partners would want to make smrs a commercially viable business so tell me how many smrs would you need to produce a year to make it commercially viable? Or would there have to be a taxpayer subsidy or a subsidy of some sort, at least at the outset? Right, so this is a, a factory product. So we design our factories for a certain drumbeat and currently we're looking at two units per annum um, and that's to keep those factories dutifully um, utilised. If it's more, we, we build more um, facilities and, and that, that's how it works. So. Um, in terms of taxpayer subsidies, we, we, we've designed this plant not to require taxpayer subsidies. Now, what we do need, however, is we need if, if we wish to accelerate deployment, we need to do certain activities in parallel. So we are talking with government as to how they can currently assist in that acceleration of this program so that we can make a significant contribution as early as possible to the UK's net zero targets. But you know, this is designed to be commercially investable. Right. So anyway, from what you said there, we're talking about the cost of electricity per megawatt hour 
uh, produced by an SMR, around about half of the projected costs of power from the new Hinkley Point station. Uh, yes. That's quite a quite a figure. Right, just a, just a few questions about health and safety, really. Now, what about SMR waste products? What are they and where would they go? I mean, you've mentioned that uh, the initial sites would be to uh, where there are existing aging nuclear power stations. So presumably the some of the infrastructure for the disposal is already in place. Um, yes, it is. It's a conventional power plant. So the infrastructure uh, for, for waste management is already in place. Um, first thing I'll mention on this is, and, and you alluded to it earlier when we were talking about costs, it's important when we compare different generation um, assets uh, on electricity price level to, to make sure we're comparing apples for apples. So our the, the cost of nuclear, the LCOEs that we quote and we get compared with the renewables, ours include full life cycle costs. So that includes all of the waste and decommissioning costs. And that's not the same in, in other industries. So before we can even start to build a plant, we have to demonstrate uh, how we will manage and deal with the waste through life and the decommissioning of the power plant. And we have to cost for that. So that's a significant distance difference. In terms of the waste products, uh, the legal obligation in the UK is that we, we maintain all of the spent fuel on site for the duration of the power plant. So that's what we will do. And that's built in to both the, the power plant design and also the costs. At the end of that, then it follows the normal disposal route um, and Yes, we, 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 we work within the, the boundaries of what is current legislation in the UK. It's important, though, to, to understand what, what waste is from a nuclear power station. So the waste from the nuclear power plant that spent fuel, it's, it's very safely stored. It's stored in containers. It's easily manageable. The waste from two operating SMR units, from two RSMR SMR units, um, could be contained within an Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's for the duration of both plants for 60 years' life. So that's the scale of it. It's, it's, it's not massive. And now, from the nuclear industry, we deal with this waste. It's safe. We've been doing it forever. We don't put it into the atmosphere. We don't put it into the sea. This is where it's very different from other industries. It's a very well understood and contained problem. Not If every other industry had, had adhered to the same requirements as nuclear, we probably wouldn't even be talking about net zero. Now, has the SMR design actually received regulatory approval at the moment in the UK or elsewhere, where, or is, is that approval process in train? Um, it's in train. We will be entering the UK regulatory process uh, later this year, early next year. And that will, that's called the generic design assessment process. It's about three and a half, four year process. And we will be, we'll, as I say, entering that either later this year or early next year. Now you've mentioned that the the initial location of the the uh, the the early SMR power stations would probably be uh, where there are existing nuclear facilities. Um, now, presumably, though, they'll require access to cooling water. So, looking ahead to other locations, is is that correct? Will they need to be near a river or by the coast or transport infrastructure to uh, build them or then remove the waste products? So yes, we do need to be near near water. The water for our plant, as a function of the design, is is less than a conventional nuclear power plant, and we've we've designed it for maximum site flexibility in that respect. But they do still need to be near a water source. This can be a lake, river, or, or, or by the coast. In terms of transport infrastructure, as I mentioned, it's designed to be road transportable. So we do not need to build new ports. Um, we do not need to build additional infrastructure at the site to accommodate staff. For example, this is a factory fabricated product, so we average during the build time on the, uh, the site for the four-year period, we average about 500 people. So we do not need um, to build large amounts of new infrastructure to, su to support a transient workforce either. That's a function of the design. It's the function of the fact that we've moved the jobs into factories where they are long-term sustainable jobs. Right. Do you think um, SMRs, uh, do you think it's feasible that SMRs could be uh form part of a, a community uh, heat and power system or district heating solution so that any waste heat is used more efficiently? It's absolutely feasible. And in fact, we are, um, we are looking at certain areas of the world where, where that is a desire. Um, and it's a desire that they're replacing existing nuclear or coal fleet that do have a CHP component to them and they want to replicate that. The, the key thing for, for using district heating, for example, is having that infrastructure associated with the district heating solution it's not it's not the smr plan if, if that's in place already then putting an smr in as a plug and play solution to provide both the heat and power is absolutely feasible 
I mean, potential opportunity here for incorporating the SMR design into a, a new city plan or something similar. Yes, yes, that is that is a very good opportunity. And, and of course, the minute you use the heat, you, you significantly improve the economics. Business of Weather, spotlighting the business opportunities of extreme weather and climate change. Right, now, moving on to my last uh, points, really, uh, about raising funds. Now, we've mentioned costs, but I'd now like to focus a little on the funds you'll need to raise to get SMRs into the production phase and use. So can you tell me what you believe the overall cost will be to get the SMR project to the stage, which we might call industrial production? Sure. Well, that's our that's the next phase of our program, um, and that's about a 490 million pound program uh, that will run till 2024 ish, and that's the the point at which we will be in full industrial production. Right. Okay. Now, how do you see the project being financed? To to what extent do you anticipate private finance will contribute to the development and construction of SMRs relative to any potential taxpayer funding? So, our objective across the fleet and the and I've mentioned this before, what we've designed the plant to be is commercially financeable. So we we envisage once we've got over the first few units that we transition to pure commercial financing for that fleet rollout. So we remove reliance on taxpayer um, from about unit five onwards. Right. OK, so up to unit five, you will need some sort of uh, taxpayer support. Um, it'd be some kind of support, whether it's direct or indirect. Um, but Yes, and, and and part of that is to allow us to accelerate the the rollout in the near term. Right. Are, are the government proving to be amenable to uh, this shorter term support? Uh, we're continuing to talk with the government, um, but I think uh, you know we have such pressing need for the net zero agenda in this in in, in the country, and we have pretty uh, important targets to meet. Nuclear has to play a role, um, so acceleration of. Uh, of, the, of our SMR program is uh, is pretty important from our perspective. Yeah. Okay. Now, just moving on to the, uh, the if you say you know private uh, commercial funding, which could be particularly exciting for investors. And now, I understand that the consortium you lead is talking to investors right now to secure an initial three hundred million pounds in funding. Is that accurate? And can you say where you are right now in terms of fundraising? Commercial fundraising, that is. Yes, that is. But we're we're, we're in the process, so I uh, sorry, I can't I can't comment on that right now. Right. Okay. So presumably, though, you are talking to a number of potential uh, investors uh, who uh, may take an interest in this. And yeah. Yes. But you can't say anything about the key investors in the project to date and those you're talking to. For example, though, can you talk in generic terms? Is there, Are there any big institutional investors out there, such as pension funds, who've potentially shown an interest? I can't talk about the, uh, the investors at the moment whilst we're in the process. I'm sorry. Now, one thing investors don't like are projects which may overrun in terms of time to complete and the cost involved. Now, given the construction of nuclear power stations in the past have met with both large cost and time overruns, do you believe SMRs can avoid such potential problems and why? So our SMR absolutely can. And the reason for that is we've designed it that way. So let me just give you a a few examples of of some of the innovations we've put into the design that allows that. So first of all, the modularization is a key component of this. Modularization is at power station level, as I mentioned. That means that 90%-ish of our power plant is manufactured in factories. Moving into that factory environment ensures that we can get control over the whole manufacturing process. It's in a controlled environment. We can get, uh, we can test the, the modules before they leave for the site, and therefore we can build certainty into those production line processes. The site activity as a result is dramatically reduced. Um, I mentioned we have an average of about 500 people on the site for module assembly. It is an assembly process at the site, and we do that also under what we call our full factory, and that's a site factory, which is a temporary structure, but that contains the, the, the whole site itself in a controlled environment. So mm-hmm. that means that we're not at risk of adverse weather over the course of the, 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 the assembly program. Uh, mm-hmm. means we're operating that assembly process in a controlled environment, and that completely removes a huge number of risks from the for program, as I say. It, it, it takes it outside of what would normally be considered an infrastructure project and into a factory fabricated product. 
So we've got a bunch of other in, innovations which are all aimed at either reducing the capital, reducing the time to build, or removing, reducing risk. All our innovations point to one of those three areas or more. And if they don't, we have to question what we're doing the innovation for. So we are avoiding implementing technology for the sake of technology. That introduces risk, potentially introduces the risk of cost time over. So we avoid that. We only introduce innovation if it's for genuine benefit. So absolutely, we believe we not just can, we will avoid um, historic problems that are traditionally associated with, with nuclear new build. Right. Now, I'd just like to ask one question, um, just to pick up on this point about commercial inv- potential commercial investors. Are you, are you by any chance considering a sort of model where you retain a stake in the SMR when it's operational? Uh, for example, uh, the income stream generated by the sale of uh, electricity? Is, is this something you're considering as a means of uh, you know, keeping the, an income stream from the project? So the Rolls Royce SMR business today is um, a business which is the technology vendor. So we will we will sell our product to, to our customers and we will provide long term service support across that fleet to those customers. That's that's this our business model today. Right. So no plans to actually, uh, if you like, cut the initial cost and take an income stream for future revenue generation. That's not currently part of our business model. No. OK, thanks for that. Now. Just like to bring our discussion to a conclusion by asking you what key lesson or lessons Rolls Royce and your partners in this project have learned to date. You know, the big lesson we've learned to date is the the value of assembling and integrating a multifunctional engineering team that brings together all of the capabilities required to design and build a power plant. So bringing together partners which have the expertise and capability in civil build, in balanced plant build, turbine island. No one company contains all that expertise. Bringing everybody in early, back in the early days of the project, the concept design phase, that's provided huge benefits in terms of the integrated power station, buildability, deliverability, and therefore investability of this solution. That's a very interesting point. I think that's applicable to all companies, no matter how big or small they may be. Alan, that concludes today's interview. So Alan Woods, Director of Strategy and Business Development on the Rolls-Royce Small Modular Reactor Programme. Thank you so much for your time and all the very best to you and your colleagues and your partners with this venture. Oh, thank you very much, Ian. It's uh, been a pleasure talking to you today. You've been listening to Business of Weather the only podcast dedicated to the business opportunities of extreme weather and climate change.